Thank you everyone for having me. I'm presenting a sort of a, a recap of a three case of studies that we um, investigated between uh, INGV and Sapienza uh, on the role of uh, fault fabrics in the control of fault sleep behavior. This is an experimental uh, approach, uh, but uh, I try to keep uh, uh, a bit of connection in the fabrics that we see in nature to give a bit uh, the big picture. And I really uh, want to thank uh, the, my co-authors that are here uh, also today um, uh, in, the, in this chat that uh, made possible uh, this work. Yeah. Here we go. So the first, uh, to give an introduction, introductory cap, uh, I would uh, say that um, uh, the approach that we have from the laboratory always start uh, a bit from the field. We go, we investigate the faults, uh, and when we observe the most uh, deformed part of the faults where the active uh, grinding and crushing of rocks happens uh, and determines uh, the uh, fault behavior, we uh, can describe these uh, directly on the field uh, with something that uh, we define generically called rock fabric. And in fact, I struggled quite a bit to find a, um, a unitary de definition of rock fabric, but I tried to give a, um, uh, what uh, is my comprehension for it now. That is, uh, for me, the, uh, a collection of all the geometrical characteristics uh, that uh, uh, are proper of uh, the materials that compose the fault uh, as a wall, but also singularly. We think about uh, the grain shape, uh, how they are distributed uh, with respect to each other or with respect to bulk uh, of the rock. This concept of fault fabric that reminds a bit uh, the, uh, the fabric uh, that is used to make the clothes. Uh, it was originally developed uh, on, uh, on the evidence that uh, uh, some rocks, especially metamorphic ones, uh, and here it has been uh, observed, uh, develop a very, very prefer uh, very uh, distinctive and repetitive uh, uh, geometrical features, such as the foliation uh, that envelops uh, those three domains. And this is uh, called a penetrative fabric of the rock, whereas in the case of uh, the cataclasite we have on the bottom left here is considered somehow a random fabric. However, these two fabric uh, can give uh, a lot of information and uh, uh, this can be seen both in the laboratory and in the field. We will see throughout uh, the case of studies. But uh, the first step uh, that we usually do is take these samples and bring to the laboratory. And obviously it's difficult to bring uh, the entire rock sample and the fault in the laboratory. You have to make some decisions. Uh, the most uh, um, common ways to transport our materials uh, to, the, to the lab is by crushing them, expecting that uh, uh, spontaneous localization happens inside this uh, material that is also found uh, in uh, exhumed faults, uh, so rock powders, they are crushed obviously, but there are also experiments with bare rocks that are more close to the engineeristical point of view of first experiments on rock friction. After we do this, uh, we, uh, we put them in the machines and we start measuring uh, the mechanical properties of them, especially in the, in, um, for us uh, is important, uh, all this, those aspects that go along with friction. So famous early study is uh, by Byerly that collects uh, a lot of, uh, of different rock types. Uh, if I don't remember, Bali is uh, on uh, SOCATS, but uh, can, uh, as different sources, this study and shows that uh, most of the rocks that have been investigated uh, at, at uh, a wide range of uh, normal uh, loads, uh, they uh, provide, they align along uh, a particular path that defines a friction coefficient that is uh, more or less uh, in, in, is comprised between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. That uh, what they, we call uh, uh, the Byersley range uh, of rock friction. And this is, is used uh, um, commonly also in numerical modeling to give uh, a generic view on the, on the friction that the material have uh, to check its response. Nonetheless, uh, there is uh, a lot of evidence that comes for particular type of minerals uh, that uh, uh, at the same conditions at which uh, these materials uh, that Byerly checked uh, uh, and plotted on this graph uh, behave uh, uh, instead in a weak manner. There are only a few examples here in Bayerly, but uh, a recent review by Cristiano uh, shows that uh, plenty of work uh, um, demonstrated that uh, particular minerals are very weak, and these are very diffused uh, in, uh, in many different types of fault uh, 
in faults in different ty uh, type of environments. Uh, these uh, are uh, considered so below Bayer'sly range, and they have a friction that can be as low as 0 .0 0 0.1 and uh, even lower when they are wet. What are those minerals? But why there is this um, separation, and if it is uh, something uh, continuous? Here, I collected a few of them in images here that uh, separates almost in a dichotomy between weak and strong materials. And every time we, uh, we uh, check them in the laboratory with a lot of literature that composes it, uh, we see that most of the weak uh, materials are anisotropic. They display uh, anisotropic crystallinity. Uh, they break also anisotropically and they stay as an anisotropic uh, creating that fabric that previously uh, was not, uh, I showed you, and is not defined uh, as random. Instead, the strong materials tend to have uh, uh, um, quite a granular shape also when they are ground and they don't have a preferential splitting or cleavage. So they stay uh, relatively cubic, as we say in crystallography, or an isotropic uh, uh, equigranular in, uh, when they're crushed. Here I missed uh, just to insert a clays that are a uh, relevant material in faults at shallow conditions, but uh, uh, you will forgive me for uh, this, uh, this step. So if we focus on uh, this category of minerals, muscovite, biotite, serpentine, serpentine chlorite, uh, and uh, clays, of course, uh, these are, uh, belong to a big family uh, of um, mineralogical components of the crust that are called phyllosilicates. And these are indeed not surprisingly weak because they are weak mechanically by the fact that uh, they are uh, grown like uh, sheets bonded by very weak, uh, weak bonds uh, that's, uh, that uh, sometimes are uh, provided only by van der Waals uh, uh, bonds, like in the case uh, of uh, uh, water in the interlayer. And these materials uh, have a, such a strong effect that uh, many studies show that more than th uh, you just need 30% of phyllosilicate as a volume fraction to strongly affect the response uh, of your mixed material uh, fault. However, I want, to, I want to point out uh, that these weak materials are not only belonging to the phyllosilicate, even if it's a dominance, uh, but they can be other materials. For example, here uh, we have molybdenite and graphite uh, that are well known as lubricants also in the industry, and they are platy, but as well, uh, but also a hematite uh, that is, uh, it can be used as an abrasive. So it is uh, not weak in the sense uh, of the classic sense of the Moss scale, it can be an abrasive. But when uh, uh, moved inside uh, uh, a friction experiment, uh, experiment it will de develop the fabric and have low friction coefficients that are as low as 0 0.25. So this really uh, uh, gives you an idea. Uh, sorry if this is a, a bit of a naive uh, approach, but uh, it, it is very visual for me using uh, the fluid dynamic approach. Uh, imagine when you design a car, and you have a bulky one that really makes a mess in the flow of air around it, while you have a perfectly aligned uh, uh, frame that uh, uh, prevents uh, resistance against the flow. This is pretty much what I see when uh, I uh, imagine these minerals aligning across and making the fabric. And if, uh, this kind of fabric is not uh, uh, temperature dependent. We see that at any conditions, this fabric develops uh, and presents the best conditions for this mineral to become weak and uh, not to pose resistance to the shear. Here, there are two cases that are uh, on, uh, on, and on uh, two uh, ends of the, of the temperature line. We have uh, low temperature SC tectonites in Marley limestone. Here we, have, we are in the stability field of, uh, of uh, clays. While on the other side, we have an pretty much identical rock, but uh, it's uh, a high temperature metamorphic rock that includes uh, transition to andalusite cordierite mica schist and you see that uh, kinematically uh, the this uh, the penetrative fabric uh, uh, is uh, spontaneously developed uh, with shear so uh, are we really introducing a bias uh, by crushing the rock or uh, cutting uh, samples uh, we can control this because uh, some studies have decided uh, to uh, take directly the rock from uh, from the field and bring it uh, with the, its own texture without crushing nor cutting it uh, and deforming it in, uh, uh, in machines, uh, for example, like Brava. And I take as a reference uh, this paper from uh, Cristiano, 
that shows that uh, systematically using the same rock uh, powdered uh, or uh, uh, keeping the, the original fabric, uh, the materials behave differently and systematically the friction coefficient is lower in uh, uh, texture and pre-textured rocks. They have the same compositions, but they don't have the same fabric. And this is uh, due to the alignment uh, and preferential orientation of these weak uh, planes uh, of, uh, that uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, the formation and crushing in the more much, uh, uh, much stronger granular fraction. Okay, having said uh, this, uh, um, this introduction, uh, I use this as a base uh, to uh, design uh, a few experiments with my uh, collaborators. Uh, and here I present uh, uh, some of the studies that we developed during my years of postdoc in uh, INGV. The first uh, is uh, a study of the development of uh, brittle fabric in fi granular phyllosilicate mixtures. So here we will not check uh, original microstructure, but we will de develop them in the laboratory and we try to uh, check one-on-one -on -one the, um, uh, the development of fabric with the frictional response. The second goes uh, into the matters of nucleation and propagation of, uh, of laboratory earthquakes, in particular uh, slow stick slip, uh, where we investigate uh, the uh, influence of inherited fault fabric uh, on the fault stability. Does the same material behave the same way if it has a different fabric? The last one, uh, a bit more uh, difficult for me to insert in this uh, context, uh, investigates uh, uh, a natural uh, uh, melange of uh, granular and phyllosilicate materials, uh, that is uh, the serpentinite uh, that we find in, uh, in many settings in nature. And I want to describe uh, it uh, frictional stability as function uh, of uh, the complex interaction, interaction that is between uh, the granular and phyllosilicate matrix and passes through the, uh, the texture, the, um, the fault fabrics, experimental fault fabrics. So let's go to the first um, to the first part. So uh, granular phyllosilicate mixtures and their uh, um, and their fabrics. When we go in nature, we can see a, diff uh, a variety of rocks, as I shown before, uh, uh, that are composed uh, of the constituent uh, material that can be phyllosilicates, granular, or platy materials. And already nature has been recognized uh, since early the difference between two and member fabrics uh, that, are, that are the YBPR and the SCC prime. The first case uh, is well, uh, well known uh, in, uh, in strong materials uh, such as uh, sandstones made of quartz uh, where we, uh, we produce these very narrow and localized uh, shear bands uh, that have, uh, have specific orientations uh, with respect uh, to the shear direction. And uh, here comes the name YBPR depending on the orientation. While, uh, as I shown you before, weak materials dispose themselves on uh, particular fabrics that are not uh, shear bands, uh, but they are foliation. And uh, even though have uh, uh, are uh, um, different uh, from, uh, from shear bands, uh, they share similar geometrical properties. And this uh, created a bit uh, of a confusion uh, in literature. Sometimes uh, some authors, uh, from, uh, for, uh, for reasons they use uh, interchangeably the YBPR fabric uh, uh, nomenclature as much as SCC prime. It's not uh, effectively wrong, uh, but it stems uh, in our idea from the fact that it's not been uh, specifically stated uh, what the separation between, uh, between the two is. And uh, we decided to start uh, this approach by first uh, deciding how to separate the two with a few simple rules. In the YBPR, with respect to SCC prime, we have a strong localization. And the strong localization is uh, um, represented by shear bands uh, where we have uh, cataclastic processes re uh, strongly reduces the grain size. Uh, and uh, this phenomenon, uh, the more it, uh, it uh, uh, evolves, the more favors uh, the uh, shear localization. Conversely, SCC fabric is something more penetrative, is a property that can be traced on the bulk of the rock down to the green scale, something that cannot be done in the YBPR, that is divided in domains. 
and uh, uh, foliation prevents cataclastic processes uh, and instead promote a distributed strain. So you see that uh, in principle, similar uh, orientations of the fabric uh, then uh, are uh, connected to different kinds of aspects. Just to give a bit of context, uh, this study stems uh, from a previous one uh, that uh, Giuseppe Volpe, here present, a uh, PhD student of Cristiano, did uh, in the Central Apennines basement uh, on the uh, rocks of the basement. And uh, luckily for us, uh, the samples we collected uh, they represent a, a good range of uh, uh, mixture of phyllosilicate and granular minerals uh, dominated by muscovite and quartz. So they pretty, uh, pretty much share the same uh, uh, mineralogy, but with, with, with different proportions. Uh, and these proportions are across that famous 30% uh, um, uh, threshold uh, that determines, in, determines the, the transition from weak to strong uh, um, response of your material described before. So taking this, uh, these samples, we, we grind them, we produce a, a green size uh, below 100%. 25 microns. So we start from non-textured powders and we uh, investigate uh, at uh, a series of different uh, uh, boundary conditions of our stress, normal stress of 25, 50, 75, 100 MPA at water saturated conditions uh, and all of them compared with the same kind of uh, experimental uh, um, uh, conditions, as I said before, uh, but equal amount of displacement. So we really compare the evolution with strain. We use uh, this machine that is Brava, hosted uh, at INGB, and uh, it's a biaxial machine, uh, essentially, when, for the use we have uh, of these uh, uh, experiments. And in that, uh, we uh, use a double direct shear assembly. There is simply two uh, layers of the, our powder materials squished between uh, uh, three blocks uh, uh, in which uh, the central one is pushed uh, to simulate uh, shear across the, uh, these uh, layers, uh, just simulating the slip uh, on the fault. The advantage of a double direct shear configuration is that we don't have interaction between metal and metal and we don't have to lubricate the fault. So all the response comes from the gouge. After, does it work? After every experiment, uh, we retrieve uh, carefully the samples, we detach them uh, from the indenter, we embed in epoxy, and then we cut a kinematic cross section and uh, we put the, uh, we, uh, we lap them so they can be seen uh, at the electronic uh, microscope and we provide the panoramas. This is a kinematic cross section that uh, has a dimension of overall two millimeters in length. And is the panorama of a uh, of a uh, multiple uh, uh, imaging of our uh, crosscut surface. Uh, kinematic uh, section means that we are seeing uh, our point of view is parallel to the fault, but uh, the cut is perpendicular uh, to it, and the shear sense is exactly uh, on on the on the screen you see. For example, this one is a uh, top to the right. Uh, uh, shear zone cut uh, in the kinematic section. And already here, I can start seeing some fabrics like these uh, through going uh, uh, cuts that are just uh, provided by the uh, unloading at the end of the experiment. Please keep in mind that all of the microstructures that we, keep, we retrieve in the laboratory will be defined as post-mortem because they can be retrieved only at the end of the experiment and we cannot see them uh, deforming. So they are representative of the last moment uh, and the whole uh, the formation history. We can see some fabric developing inside away from these cuts. And uh, if we compare all of these experiments, uh, in total 24 panoramas, uh, we obtain two end members. The most uh, enriching granular materials, the more, most quartz rich, uh, the 25% phyllosilicate, uh, will develop uh, a white BPR fabric. So shear bands uh, here represented with the gray, that uh, where we have uh, uh, intense uh, uh, cataclastic uh, grain size reduction, and we have uh, almost on the form material outside. This is the extreme case uh, where we have a single uh, uh, localized uh, deformation band at the boundary. The, ex the other extreme case uh, uh, is the development uh, of a SCC prime fabric in the most uh, phyllosilicatic ma materials uh, where we don't see localized deformation as in the case uh, on the top, uh, but we see intense foliation uh, distributing the whole sample. 
But these two end members are not uh, uh, don't appear drastically uh, from uh, by varying the ratio between uh, granular and phyllosilicatic material. Here we see a continuous transition from a diffused uh, uh, foliation, typical of SC C prime fabric with C and C prime planes, that uh, with the increasing amount of granular materials start uh, more, uh, the, having less uh, strong intensity of the foliation and then localize into narrow shear zones. So this is a, really a transition between the two and men fabrics. But uh, does this reflect uh, itself uh, on, the, on the frictional behavior of this material? In order to do this, uh, we can check uh, not only the friction that I, uh, the friction coefficient, uh, that is the most uh, uh, immediate and primary aspect uh, of uh, rock deformation in the laboratory, as I shown in the introductory cup, but we can do some uh, another additional kind of tests for frictional healing. We do slide or slide test. There are here. Basically, we stop the fault, uh, the experimental fault in the laboratory for some time, and then we start shearing it again. And we repeat the test at the, inc at the incrementally longer fold uh, steps. And this gives an idea of what is the frictional, but also chemical healing that intercurs, uh, for example, during an interseismic phase when the fault is not uh, slipping at uh, faster velocity. We can also check uh, what is uh, the difference in uh, friction when uh, we change the slip velocity on our fault. And this is uh, the classic rate and state approach uh, that uh, describes uh, how, fault, uh, how fault friction uh, has a secondary uh, effect of evolution depending on, uh, uh, on uh, the rate at which uh, we are uh, deforming the fault uh, in the laboratory. So here we collect uh, these uh, um, these results uh, and we um, we plot the uh, friction coefficient in a more uh, more Coulomb uh, uh, in a Coulomb envelope. Here we have no cohesion, and we see clearly see the separation that warm colored materials, so the one that are granular rich, really go close to the Byersley range, while the phyllosilicate rich tend to stay away. So again, we saw what we see in the we saw in the in the in the uh, in the introduction, so uh, phyllosilicate rich materials are weaker, and not only the healing uh, granular rich materials tend to have high frictional healing uh, compared to phyllosilicate uh, rich materials, and uh, the rate and state uh, fundamental parameters A and B for now, and will not describe uh, what uh, what they're useful for, but uh, just to keep in, uh, just to see that here we have a clear separation from granular rich and phyllosilicate rich that uh, segregate uh, on. Uh, on this plot. So uh, another thing that we see is that also there is a sort of relationship that comes with normal stress. And we also saw that uh, uh, fabrics do have different aspects, not only depending on the content uh, of uh, initial uh, materials, but also on the development of fabric depending on the normal stress. In fact, this kind of convergence uh, between uh, uh, between the two granular rich and phyllosilicate materials, remember that uh, both have a high content of phyllosilicates, uh, tell that uh, uh, textures are developing more when you go at high stress. And this is exactly what uh, is represented here in the schematic. Uh, it shows that uh, the, the deformation becomes more distributed and more penetrative the higher we go higher in stress. And this is not surprising because also in nature we have this kind of evidence this is a bit pushing uh, the the, um, the comparison, but uh, it reminded me of the classic scheme of uh, how a, a big fault uh, uh, show its textures uh, within the crust. And we see that with depth, we start having more and more foliated material. So development, really the pervasive development, development of fabric. So uh, the figure of recap of this paper by uh, Giuseppe Volpe here present uh, that uh, I, I recommend you to, to check. It came out just today, which is just a, a nice coincidence. Uh, gives uh, mostly an overview of something that is not new, but uh, required uh, um, a systematic uh, approach. Here we, we, we collect uh, first order control of the fabric where we have uh, uh, variation from YBPR to SCC fabric uh, that goes along with uh, uh, decreasing uh, friction and change of fabric, sorry, and, and change of uh, starting material. 
But we have also the second order effect that go to influence uh, the rate and state parameters and uh, the evolution of friction with displacement can be the, the grain shape. Uh, the more it uh, deformed, the more rounded the grain shape will be. The phyllosilicate networking strain will increase the, the networking of the weak phase, thus reducing the friction. Also, stress will have this effect. Then we have the foliation regularity and also the flattening. The more we go on a stress, the more flat and prone to, uh, to be weak uh, towards the slip uh, will be our uh, fabric. This was an overview and uh, of uh, concepts that are already there in literature. And with the second uh, uh, case of study, I wanted to move more on the, the influence uh, of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of fold fabric on the second order uh, properties of friction. And in this case, we select uh, a particular kind of rock here that is uh, anhydrite and dolomite. Let me first uh, do a quick recap. We've seen before that uh, we can retrieve uh, rate and state parameters, the A, A and B values. These come from uh, this uh, law that uh, describes uh, the variation uh, of delta mu, the, the variation of, uh, of friction on fault, uh, depending on the velocity step, so from V0 to V, that of course with a direct effect A and an evolution effect uh, described by B and uh, a state variable that has a dimension of time and one that has a day dimension, this D sub C dimension uh, of uh, displacement. Uh, I will not go into detail of this, but I will just show that uh, uh, on the uh, ignoring the evolution effect, uh, the A uh, subtracting uh, uh, B to A will give us uh, the uh, proportionality of uh, our increment uh, or decrement of friction. If the I minus B parameter, uh, that is a, a property of the rock, is, uh, is positive, we will be in velocity strengthening conditions. If it is negative, we are in velocity weakening. So the more I go faster, the less is the frictional resistance of my experimental material. And velocity weakening materials are important because are those that mostly uh, uh, control the unstable behavior of material, both in generalistically, uh, so described here by this uh, simple spring slide model, but also in the theory of fault, uh, velocity weakening materials are those that are prone to nucleate and propagate uh, earthquakes. But uh, this is not sufficient. If we take uh, a simplification of our uh, fault system as an elastic medium that pushes against an anisotropy that is uh, our uh, uh, discontinuity of the fault, uh, we have an additional parameter that determines whether uh, uh, unstable slip can nucleate or not. It's called the critical stiffness. It's conveniently derived by using the parameters A minus B and DC. And as a dimension of a stiffness, it can be and is compared to the stiffness of our elastic loading medium. And uh, we see two uh, possibilities, two outcomes. We have a bifurcation. If my uh, stiffness uh, of the lasting loading medium is high compared to the uh, case uh, critical stiffness, then the ratio will be higher than one, and the fault will uh, will uh, and the, our material will uh, stably sliding even if it's velocity weakening, just because the unloading path of my material towards a steady state condition is slower than the elastic uh, uh, unloading of my elastic uh, surrounding medium. Vice versa, if we have a, a case sub C that is much higher than the elastic medium or the elastic medium is much less stiff uh, than uh, this critical stiffness, we have a ratio that is uh, smaller than one and we can have unsta unstable slip that uh, occurs uh, in this uh, simple modern uh, as uh, uh, cyclic uh, uh, stick slip behavior. We can vary in the laboratory this, uh, the stiffness uh, of uh, uh, our spring and do many tests. And uh, recent studies, here I use as an example the one uh, of uh, Lehman and co authors uh, uh, of 2016. We can reproduce uh, a wide variety of frictional behaviors from stable sliding when uh, K over K sub C is uh, much higher than one, is uh, higher than one. We transit uh, into uh, marginally uh, unstable to slow stick slip events uh, that have been compared to slow slip and tremors in nature. And then we can transit into uh, real uh, laboratory earthquakes with audible uh, stick slip events uh, that release a lot of energy. 
There is a recent study from Marco also here uh, that uh, recently uh, checked uh, when uh, the K over K sub C um, uh, ratio is close to one. So we generate slow slick, slow slick, stick slip events. Uh, and he checked uh, the influence of fold fabric uh, on the mode uh, at which uh, uh, the fold slips. In both cases, uh, here we, uh, he used uh, uh, anhydride dolomite for one case and quartz for the other. Uh, we see a pretty different uh, stick slip behavior where the velocity function that describes how the fold slips in time uh, during the instability, it's uh, in the case of anhydride dolomite, uh, uh, asymmetric to the left, uh, see the, the green lines here that represent the evolution of velocity with time. This is similar to the Yoffe source function that are found for a natural earthquake, for uh, some natural earthquakes. While in, in Minusil quartz, uh, we have uh, an opposite uh, trend, uh, almost Gaussian, almost symmetric, where we have a gentle acceleration to peak. Uh, and uh, this has been attributed uh, to the role of fabric, where in anhydride dolomite, we have distributed deformation, while in quartz, we have more localized deformation. However, to a certain extent, uh, this is uh, interesting, but not satisfactory, because we are speaking about two, more uh, two different materials. Uh, as uh, introduced before, uh, the, as a next step, uh, we together decided uh, to uh, investigate uh, fabrics on only one material. Uh, to give, uh, again, a bit of context, uh, why it's important to uh, study the, uh, the uh, anhydride dolomite uh, mixtures, we just moved uh, a bit uh, above the, uh, the basement uh, studied in the first ca case of study, and uh, we're moving in the most seismogenic layer of the central Apennines, and we see that anhydride dolomite is a good candidate for fault instability and nucleation of earthquakes, so it is uh, indeed relevant uh, to uh, the, our understanding on the subject. So we take uh, this anhydride to dolomite mixtures, we place them uh, powdered uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in our apparatus. We want a spontaneous development uh, of fabric without uh, pre-imposing it. But uh, uh, differently from the experiments before, we introduce another element uh, in the apparatus, uh, and uh, it is a vertical spacer that reduces consistently the stiffness uh, of my loading medium, so th that is the vertical ram. So from metal, we put a plexiglass that has a lower stiffness and brings us, uh, uh, compared obviously with the literature that uh, Marco produced on higher dolomite, uh, close to the condition for slow, slow, slick, stick, slow, slow stick slip behavior. And uh, the design is uh, composed of two main steps. The experiments will start uh, with the texturing phase. I, I said we started with uh, a material that is granular and identical for all experiments. So the way to do textures uh, takes uh, um, inspiration from the first data set. Uh, we, uh, we know that textures develop differently depending on the normal stress. So we will do four experiments, 15, 35, 60, and 100 MPA of normal stress conditions. And we, we let uh, our experimental fall to texture for 13 millimeters. Uh, of total sleep at the same velocity, one microns per second. So here, the only condition that is different between the experiments is just the normal load. After this, we bring all of these uh, experimental faults, uh, keeping them in the machine, to the same normal stress. Some of them will have an increased uh, stress. For example, from 15, we will go to 35. Others will decrease or stay the same. And uh, we want to check when when re-shearing, so reactivating them at the same condition with the spring mounted on the machine, if they will give us a different uh, response depending on the inherited fabric. These are the curves, uh, mechanical curves produced during the texturing phase. You see that uh, the friction coefficient here evolves uh, stably. We are in the condition not to trigger uh, fault instability, very stiff uh, machine. We have some kind of variability, but uh, what we obtain is a range between uh, 5.5 and 6.5 of friction coefficient. Uh, unfortunately, anhydride dolomite is a bit variable, but it, it keeps consistent with the textures. Upon reactivation, though, the, the effect is totally different. We see that reloading the same textures uh, uh, obtained during the texturing phase, uh, but uh, at the same normal stress, uh, we will have those that uh, um, uh, were at uh, lower normal stress and are now brought to, to higher stress, uh, they are uh, uh, sliding stably. 
while uh, the, the other extreme case, like the 100 MPA or the 60 that uh, have been reactivated, they manifest these huge stress drops. So they can go up to uh, 11 or even 20 in an experiment uh, um, amount of uh, stress drop here. And then uh, they start uh, sl uh, sliding with the stick slip behavior, something that is not observed uh, for the folds that have been textured at 35 to 15 MPA. So it really tells you that uh, it's not the, the, the boundary conditions, it's really the material and its inner fabric that determines these kind of different behavior when placed at the same boundary conditions. We can check this by collecting the samples at the end of each texturing phase. In this case, I had to rerun another set of identical experiments. And we take the samples that were reactivated. Here I show you what happens uh, uh, as uh, in the fabrics uh, when we have uh, stable conditions uh, during reactivation or unstable conditions. This, uh, uh, remember a bit more, a bit the, um, the microstructures I showed you before with the first case is exactly the same kinematic section. Here we are just very close. Uh, uh, we are close, closing in uh, to the principal slip zone where most of the deformation is accommodated. And we see that uh, at 15, uh, at, uh, sorry, uh, here is an error at uh, uh, 15 MPA. The, uh, the texture is, uh, is typical of a YPPR fabric and is uh, very localized in this narrow shear zone where most of the cataclastic products are, that is around 100 microns. Whereas uh, in the case of the unstable material, our principal slip zone is much wider. It contains some uh, foliation textures and uh, the principal slip zone is not very well uh, recognizable here, even though it is, uh, uh, there is a place where you have higher grain size reduction. If we go to investigate uh, a piece of uh, the, the principal slip zone, the stable and stable behavior, we see that they are completely different. A stable sliding is uh, um, is a concentrate is a localized within a coarse granular shear zone. Here you see that uh, many grains are above uh, five microns, and uh, the matrix uh, of uh, cataclastic products uh, it's uh, relatively small in abundance, and uh, it is very heterogeneous, uh, showing uh, angular clusters. In the case of 100 MPA, is a different word. We have everything that is commuted almost uh, entirely below the one micron size is uh, a phonetic also at the, at the SEM. And is very, very homogeneous. We don't have porphyroclasts. We don't have uh, uh, a distribution of grain sizes as in the case of uh, uh, stable sliding. First difference. Then these two textures can be reactivated. Uh, in um, And we will focus especially on the uh, unstable cases. The reactivation phase of uh, experiments performed at 160 MPA have these uh, big stress drops uh, that I uh, showed you before. And uh, in, in this particular case at 100 MPA, we, can, uh, we measured uh, even velocities that are higher than one meter per second. We really had the seismic slip uh, and we have stress drop uh, higher than 10 MPA. If we compare again the two previous uh, textures, uh, we add uh, one uh, important uh, uh, feature of uh, our uh, nanogranule gouge here is uh, strongly enlarged, is that is very low in porosity. So we have some chemical effect uh, of, uh, on, the, on the texture that reduces the porosity and allows uh, for the fabric to recover uh, quite a lot of strength. And um, to be more clear with it, uh, I will uh, show step by step what happens across the reactivation. These are textures recovered uh, just before the uh, reactivation phase. Here is uh, a point that reminds you where we are, more or less. Imagine that we are loading a fault and it's not moving until peak stress. And this is the texture that is uh, um, bearing uh, our, uh, our shear stress before uh, reactivation. We see that extreme grain size comminution foliation that reveals thin gradient, and we have a ribbon-like alignment of grains, porphyroclasts, and low porosity, something that reminds uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, a semi-brittle behavior of rocks. Upon reactivation, just after the stress drop, we could retrieve one sample in a, in a, in a repeat. And we see that deformation in this case 
has been localized in a very narrow shear zone of 30 micron that is very similar to those that are described in high, uh, high velocity friction uh, uh, experiments performed, for example, in Shiva, a uh, machine that we have in NGV, but uh, in general in rotary machines that simulate uh, earthquake propagation. And there is a good evidence that uh, earthquake sleep occurred on this sample too, because we have uh, some evidence of the carbonation, uh, uh, so the sulfatation in the, in the, um, in the anhydrite matrix here represented by bubbles in the, in, in the otherwise very low porosity material. But then remember that uh, after this uh, reactivation event, we had the stick slip uh, and the fault changes phase again. And we observed that uh, this uh, very dense uh, and low porosity principal slip zone is reworked pervasively by cataclastic, uh, by cataclases. And the ca new catacl cataclastic uh, uh, broken bits of principal slip zone are indeed formed by the texture that you see before reactivation even occurs. So they are still. Uh, 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 adhesive uh, to themselves. They make uh, uh, clusters of materials. And this tells you that textures uh, uh, that uh, are not only the uh, passive alignment of minerals, but is also the active interaction between the grains and also frictional chemical healing may uh, contribute in the fabric in controlling unstable reactivation. And so, as I said, uh, reactivation events are not repeatable as much as the uh, the middle texture that I showed you before is not preserved uh, throughout the sleep uh, during our uh, um, the formation history. And now uh, we uh, analyze, like Marco did, the stick sleep uh, behavior of this material, and we see something very interesting. These are the same starting material with different fabric reactivated at the same boundary conditions. And their sleep velocity function, so how the fault ac uh, accelerates and decelerates uh, during every, stick, uh, every sleep event, uh, is totally different. In the experiments done at 60 microns per second, the texture will provide uh, these uh, similar uh, sleep velocity functions to the one Marco did, so left asymmetric, reminiscent of the Yoff uh, sleep velocity function, while the one done at 100 MPa uh, we'll have a more Gaussian and more reminiscent uh, of the stick slip uh, observed uh, in quartz. Only that uh, here is the same material. So again, uh, if the boundary conditions are the same and the material is the same, then will be the, uh, imputable to the fabric, the control on how the slip is distributed during the, each dynamic event. And again, we see that even though very comminuted, as I was saying at the, be at the beginning, the material is more heterogeneous in the case of 60 MPa. There was not enough energy to homogenize my grain size uh, to put it uh, at very low below micron scale. And this uh, in, uh, in a quali qualitative uh, uh, model, micromechanical model, they have uh, they represent heterogeneities in my in uh, in the flow of the material in the principal slip zone, possibly jamming, enhancing the effect of stress localization, in particular uh, localized uh, force chains that yield rapidly into uh, uh, fast acceleration and fast stick slip. Gaussian events instead uh, nucleate inside uh, very homogeneous material, very fine grained, uh, like in the case of uh, Minusil, that uh, might sustain more distribute more uh, and better distributed uh, shear stress across the fault, so lower stress concentration, and uh, also uh, uh, more evenly spaced uh, force chains that, that do don't allow for uh, catastrophic failure of my entire fault. The last, uh, the last case of study will be on serpentinites. We move a bit away from uh, the central Apennines and we move uh, here in the Elba Island. Here is uh, um, a thrust in serpentinites where they cultivate uh, grapes, but the wine doesn't come out uh, great, so I don't recommend it. And uh, to just give, uh, again, the geological context, uh, serpentinites, uh, are uh, the product uh, of a hydrous alteration, metamorphism uh, of mantle rocks, especially donites, uh, that are uh, rocks uh, very enriched uh, in olivine. And they are very important constituents uh, of a, a huge variety of settings. We go from uh, orogenic uh, buildup uh, uh, shear zones, uh, we go into subduction zones and mid ocean ridges and transforms. Uh, just because we have uh, materials that uh, from the ocean crust that is impinged uh, and uh, uh, metamorphosed uh, in, in, in the presence of uh, uh, water uh, and uh, temperature. 
And uh, uh, serpentinite is a complex rock, it is a, a, polyphasic a polyphasic material that is dominantly composed by serpentine. And serpentine minerals belong to the, the big uh, family that I was describing in the, in the introduction, that is the phyllosilicate. They have uh, uh, the same formula, but they have uh, very different aspects depending on the conditions at which they form. And we have, might have uh, the most uh, representative uh, lizardite, chrysotile, and tigorite, amongst other. And these three particular mineral uh, are extremely prone to pressure solution, and they move uh, in the flow in this uh, shear zone inside uh, high strain domains that surround uh, low strain domains uh, where the initial material is. So pressure solution really segregates uh, and uh, um, uh, produces these veins that are pure serpentine in, uh, uh, that envelop uh, uh, coarser and lowly deformed uh, materials. Why is this important? Because uh, phyllosilicates, uh, as you reminded before, and the, it's the same case uh, for, uh, for um, uh, serpentinites, are very weak. So segregation of weak phases uh, in high strain domains uh, will make uh, serpentinite bodies inherently weak, uh, independently on the complexity of the shear zone. And this is exactly what we see in Elba Island. This is the, uh, the outcrop of Montefico that we've seen before. And we see that uh, there are low strain domains uh, enveloped by very tiny uh, ve veins of pure lizardite. Uh, in this case, uh, is the dominant uh, serpentinite po uh, serpentine uh, polytype. Uh, and uh, um, in this case, I decided to focus not on the weakest material, but on what is left uh, on uh, the low strain domains. The, the motivation is that uh, uh, when we think about uh, subduction zones uh, or uh, other places where uh, tectonic melange is uh, present, uh, uh, numerical modeling and field evidences uh, show us that uh, these uh, are uh, hard and break inside the flow. Even if the, uh, the serpentinite body is weak, they still can move inside, uh, jam and break. And this is a mechanism that uh, explains uh, uh, tremors uh, and slow sleep uh, and nucleation of, uh, of uh, events, uh, even when the tectonic melange is very weak, uh, as in the case in serpentinites, in the case here of uh, the paper of Tarling and co collaborators, or in other phyllosilicate uh, uh, rich uh, materials, uh, as in the case of Fager and Biel. But there are many cases in nature. So uh, I take serpentinite. Uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a study case, mostly because it, uh, in the low strain domains, uh, this, uh, this uh, rock is composed by, uh, again, a mixture of phyllosilicate and granular. Here, the granular fraction is, is uh, represented by magnetite and pyroxene. So uh, presents a very good uh, case of study, similar to the, the previous uh, presented. Uh, where we can develop a C fabric and check how it influences uh, the frictional stability. So again, we crush these rocks. We don't keep the, uh, the fabric and powdered. We put them in the same exact configuration that I used for the first uh, case of study on uh, uh, quartz and uh, muscovite mixtures. This is uh, how the friction curve uh, uh, looks like. Here we go, we have the friction coefficient evolving uh, uh, with displacement. We have, uh, again, uh, the test on uh, slide or slide and velocity steps, uh, very similar to the second, second case described before. And we already see that uh, the normal stress at which we investigated has some effect on friction. So it's not properly behaving in a, uh, um, according to the uh, uh, Coulomb criterion, but there is an effect uh, on normal stress uh, on the friction. And then if we compare to pure lizardite, we see that this material that is a magnetite rich has a higher friction coefficient as expected. There's nothing different from what uh, shown, shown before. And uh, there is anyway, something new that appears in our experiments. Even though we didn't put any spring in our system, this material is very unstable. Lizardite, that is the case of the zoom in of this velocity step. So here we have the conditions sliding at very low velocities, one micron per second. Pure lizardite behaves uh, easily with uh, stable sliding, while, philo while uh, serpenti magnetite serpentina, magnetite rich serpentinite, they do stick slip. They, uh, they are unstable. 
And this is especially uh, visible at high stress. Here in, uh, it's almost stable at 25 MPa, but is uh, unstable at uh, more than it. And this is not surprising because the K sub C, that is the constitutive parameter that determines whether our fault is unstable or not, uh, depends also on the normal stress. So until now, nothing really curious. But there is another fact that is important, the fact that there is a velocity dependency to the fault stability, because we see that stick slip behavior is very pronounced at a very low uh, loading point velocity, so the velocity at which we force the uh, fault to slip, and it would be zero from 0 0.1 microns per second up to 5, where we have the last instability, it's very small, but above 7, we quench totally the instability and the fault will undergo stable slip. This obviously, uh, as uh, the um, approach we used for the first two uh, studies, I impute this uh, to a difference in the, in the fabrics, since we have uh, a different, uh, uh, different, a different uh, um, texture depending on the normal stress applied. And this is really the case for serpentinides. In the case of low stre normal stresses, 25, the, the formation is localized I can uh, I can say on a on a single plane that is uh, here highlighted with the yellow the principal slip zone that cuts like a knife at the top of my of my fault and then uh, uh, and then uh, going up uh, with stress we see that it starts delocalizing and become wider and wider and uh, associated to it we have the development of C fabric and reduction of grain size. Now we can uh, check the rate and state parameters, and we see that uh, they depend uh, unsurprisingly of the low uh, slip uh, velocity, and we can do a best fit, uh, and we can retrieve uh, the variation of K sub C as we've done before, but uh, as a function of uh, the slip velocity. And we can compare it to find if this criterion really works. What we need uh, to make uh, this uh, recipe work uh, is K, so the stiffness of our loading medium that will be the one of the machine plus the one of my experimental sample. This can be retrieved easily by plotting the friction coefficient as a function of loading point displacement. And we check the slope of the lasting loading phase that represents our stick uh, phase of the stick slip uh, behavior. We retrieve uh, the normalized stiffness. In this case, uh, is divided by the normal stress, so I can plot both experiments, 100 MPa and 60 MPa, and then we plug it with uh, the K sub C that uh, we we've seen before that has been retrieved from uh, the velocity step analysis. And something uh, is off here. Even though we predict uh, that there is a transition into stable sliding, these, of course, uh, at very high velocities, 18 microns per second. And the last uh, stable uh, uh, experiments, uh, so uh, loading point velocity close to five and seven, have uh, K over K sub C, sub -C over, uh, that is uh, around 0 0.5, that is, uh, according to literature, far from being uh, uh, approximated uh, um, associated to slow stick slip, uh, as in our case. And uh, so we are far away from the stability transition. Why is this? Uh, we have to go back and check effectively what is happening on fault. And the most uh, surprising thing is that this is not really stick slip, but something that is creep slip. Because here in green, I plot uh, instead of the loading point position, so the position of my piston that obviously is controlled by the machine, I plot the uh, displacement that is measured with a sensor directly on the fault. And we see that when it should be locked, and we have this elastic loading phase, the fault is not locked, but creeps and uh, uh, accommodates displacement that is uh, represented here before an uh, uh, unstable slip occurs by these uh, black arrows. Conveniently, we can subtract the loading point position. Uh, from the loading point position, we can subtract the permanent deformation of fault. And this should give us only the elastic part of this deformation. So how much, uh, how much displacement is stored elastically and recoverably. And unsurprisingly, when we use this blue curve to plot our friction coefficient, then all these stick slip events collapse on one on a curve that has no hysteresis and represent the loading and loading path that occurs elastically during every stick slip event. And in this case, we see that the stiffness 
is higher than the appearance stiffness, just because obviously uh, the displacement, elastic displacement is smaller than the one that was apparent before. Um, bear with me, this is a bit of a complicated way to present the data, but uh, I decided to uh, give a representation of what has happened on the fault using a parameter that is the in experimental interseismic coupling. It's nothing but uh, the velocity of uh, my creep in the interseismic period divided by the loading point velocity. If my parameter is around zero, it means that the fault is stable sliding, so it's creeping as fast as I push it. If it's one, it means that the fault is completely locked. And uh, my appearance stiffness uh, that I measured before can be plotted as a function of the inter experimental interseismic coupling. And this is very interesting because when the, fa uh, the fault is coupled, so is creeping less uh, in the interseismic period, then the stiffness is higher. And if we plot the corrected uh, stiffness uh, that we retrieve by removing the creep part, uh, so simulating uh, interseismic coupling of one, we obtain exactly what we were expecting. We remove the creep part, and now the friction, the, the stability criterion works because we have exactly the transition close to seven. And we can predict, uh, and we can, uh, and we have a nice alignment of our frictional properties at uh, the k over k sub c, depending on the sliding velocity measured at the time that uh, the fault is creeping. So this material works uh, in a mixed behavior. We have uh, a viscose part uh, that represents the creep uh, that is uh, uh, derived by the fact the field of silicate matrix that envelop uh, the uh, strong, uh, logically strong material flows around these uh, porphyroclasts. Uh, and we know from previous literature that uh, really phyllosilicates, when they are subjected to very low strain rates, like um, nanometers per second, they flow according to a viscose law. While we have granular that create uh, a partial load bearing framework that uh, behaves frictionally all the time and can give rise to this instability that we don't see in pure lizardite simply because we don't have the strong frictional granular material. Obviously, texture recovered are recovered only post-mortem. And this uh, scam, scheme that I will present you here can be only conceptual, but I find it quite uh, uh, interesting and uh, is supported by other um, uh, data that I'm not presenting here for uh, sake of brevity. But uh, uh, it uh, separates uh, two different kind of uh, uh, stages. When we are sliding at low velocities, and especially in favor of a high stress, we allow the time scale for phyllosilicate to flow viscously around porphyroclast of the strong phase, that is the one typically velocity weakening. We produce undulous SC fabric that is not uh, aligned perfectly to accommodate the uh, fold parallel flow. And we create we create the condition for interaction of uh, granular materials. We uh, uh, make them closer together, and we promote uh, the formation of partial load bearing framework, still separated by phyllosilicate, but much stiffer. This uh, gives uh, a larger K sub C that promotes uh, unstable slip, thus the uh, cycling uh, behavior of locking and unlocking. When we are at high velocities and low stresses, everything transits into frictional behavior and we dilate the fault. By dilating, we reduce the interaction of the granular strong material and porphyroclast uh, having less interaction, they cannot lock the fault and disrupt the stick slip behavior going into a stable sliding. And this uh, is uh, uh, in concomitance with a uh, severe reduction of the K sub C. Uh, with this, I conclude. I didn't. Uh, I thought not to put uh, final remarks uh, because I thought it was already enough. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Wonderful, really nice, Giacomo. Please, everyone, um, join me in uh, unmuting long enough to uh, thank Giacomo for a fabulous talk. <laughs>